Plant-based diets are becoming more and more popular with many reports of people fixing all kinds of health issues with them. On the other hand, you also have people that crash on it and feel way better eating animal-based proteins. In this video, I want to discuss the genetics and biochemistry behind this and explain how you can predict whether you will thrive or crash on a vegan diet. To start things off, why even record this video in the first place? Plant-based diets are more popular than ever. A lot of people are switching to them, especially young people, and some do it for ethical reasons, which I won't discuss in this video, but others do it because of health reasons. And there is definitely something to it. I know some people who do a lot better as vegans. But unfortunately, I also know the flip side. So people who went vegan and then crashed and had to go back to eating animal products. How is this possible? How can the same diet have these two extreme outcomes for different people? The obvious answer to this is that no diet is right for everyone. A lot of people simply recommend what worked for them, and they assume it also works for everyone else. But that's like saying everyone should wear size 10 shoes because they fit me. Instead, you should understand the potential risks and benefits of a diet before adapting it. This video is supposed to help you with that. It's for people who are thinking about becoming vegans, but also for people who might already be vegan but have problems on it and cannot figure out why. As you will see in a second, there are certain genetic aspects as well as pre-existing conditions that you might have that can make or break the diet for you. To understand the risks and benefits of a vegan diet, you need to understand its nutrient profile. Every restrictive diet has a specific nutrient profile because it favors one type of food over another. Vegan and plant-based diets usually look something like this, assuming you don't supplement anything. They are high in carbohydrates, moderate to low in protein, and moderate to low in dietary fat. That's because you eat mostly vegetables and grains for carbs. As for protein, you are left with legumes and nuts. And most vegans don't eat a lot of them unless they're bodybuilders. That's why their protein intake will be moderate to low. And in terms of dietary fat, you have nuts and certain fatty plant foods like avocados, olives, or certain plant oils. Again, most vegans don't eat a huge number of those, so their diet will also be moderate to low in fat. With this nutrient profile in front of us, what does that mean exactly? What are the pros and cons here? As for pros, you have a high potassium intake. Nowadays, most people don't eat enough potassium and suffer from subclinical or even outright potassium deficiency. The large quantities of vegetables you consume as a vegan, along with some fruit, help overcome this problem. If you eat a lot of quality whole grains and some nuts, you will also have a fairly good magnesium intake. I would still look into supplementation though, because almost everyone is borderline magnesium deficient. The high number of alkaline minerals and vegetables also reduce your risk of metabolic acidosis. This is a controversial topic and basically refers to acids building up in your body. Whether it happens outside of health conditions like kidney diseases or diabetes is heavily debated and I can't get into it in this video. But what we do often see is people who consume low amounts of alkaline reserve minerals like magnesium and potassium, while also eating too many foods high in phosphorus and sulfur, which are acid forming, is that this imbalance favors inflammation and other problems. In that sense, consuming more vegetables high in alkaline minerals would be beneficial. But like I said before, it's a controversial topic, and it also doesn't apply if you overeat on grains, which are also high in phosphorus and on top of that phytic acid, which interferes with the absorption of minerals. The last potential benefit is a lower risk of iron overload. Iron overload is a topic I discuss in much more detail in a different video. It can be an issue, especially among men who eat a lot of meat. It isn't always detected through normal blood tests because the iron buildup happens in your tissue and not in your blood. And while this is definitely an issue that flies under the radar of many people, 
I wouldn't necessarily call it an argument to go vegan and instead more of an argument to limit your intake of red meat and iron foods and to not go crazy with them. Great, now that we talked about the potential benefits, let's also talk about the potential drawbacks of a plant-based slash vegan diet. Most sources will name nutrient deficiencies like B12, calcium, and iron. I don't really want to get into them in this video because you will probably already be aware of them and also because the standard advice to simply supplement them is often misguided. Especially low calcium and iron values often aren't due to a deficiency, but rather a bioavailability problem and over supplementing them can lead to other problems down the line. I will link videos that cover this in more detail for you to check out if you're interested. Instead, I think we should talk about the low amounts of sulfur containing amino acids that many vegans are consuming. I'm referring to taurine, cysteine and methionine and this can be especially problematic if you have a sluggish liver since these are important nutrients for liver detoxification and bile production. Unless you are specifically including foods or supplements that have these nutrients in them, most vegans will be low in them and this also goes for nutrients that can mitigate this problem like creatine or carnitine. They are mostly found in animal tissue which you aren't consuming as a vegan. Whether this turns out to be a problem for you depends on your individual biochemistry because some people even thrive on methionine restriction. It mostly has to do with methylation which I will cover later in the video. Another potential problem with vegan diets that I often see neglected online is that of vitamin A. Vitamin A in your diet exists in two forms, preformed vitamin A and provitamin A. Vegans who only eat plant foods will only be taking in the provitamin A in the form of beta carotene usually found in carrots for example. Now the problem with this is that provitamin A is not bioavailable to the body. It first needs to be converted into retinol, the preformed vitamin A. This is the vitamin A that you find in animal tissue because a cow, for example, has already done the conversion of the provitamin A to the preformed vitamin A. As a vegan, you have to do this conversion yourself and there are some people where it doesn't really work right. We will get to that in a second. Before that though, the last potential drawback you should be aware of if you're thinking about going vegan is the low zinc, high copper combination of plant-based diets. That's because you are favoring copper heavy grains and nuts over zinc heavy meats. Your zinc copper ratio is extremely important for health and we will also discuss it in more detail later. So these are the general pros and cons of vegan diets. But what do your genes have to do with all of this? As you might imagine, your genes influence what type of nutrients you need more or less of. So they indirectly determine whether the pros and cons of vegan diets will be a problem or a benefit to you. To explain what I mean, let's start with the BCM1 gene. I already talked about the two types of vitamin A before. The BCM1 gene encodes an enzyme called beta carotene monooxygenase 1. And this enzyme is responsible for the conversion of beta carotene to retinol which is then converted into bioactive retinol. If you have a BCM01 polymorphism, so a gene variation, then this will affect your ability to convert beta carotene into retinol. And these polymorphisms are actually fairly common. It is estimated that around 30 to 40% of people with European descent have some sort of polymorphism in the BCM01 gene. This would then mean a reduction in enzyme activity, which in turn means lower levels of bioactive retinol. Now, if you consume preformed vitamin A products, so animal products, having a BCM01 polymorphism doesn't really matter because you're covering all your retinol through external sources. But if you rely on plant foods for your vitamin A, then you're banking on your BCM01 gene to do the heavy lifting. If it isn't working at full capacity, you have a higher likelihood of a vitamin A deficiency even at normal beta carotene intake levels. Also keep in mind that certain thyroid hormones regulate the activity of BCM01, so it's not just your genetics. 
especially T3 is important here because it increases BCMO1 activity. What that means is that low T3 levels or a sluggish thyroid, for example, because of an iodine or a selenium deficiency, can also lead to problems, even when you don't have a BCMO1 polymorphism. The next gene, or rather collection of genes that I want to talk about, are all methylation-related. Methylation describes the addition or subtraction of a methyl group to other molecules. This can be neurotransmitters, hormones, or even your DNA. It's really one of the most basic processes in our body. And when people think of methylation, they usually only think of the MTHFR gene. It's one of the most well-known methylation-related genes. But there are others, for example, the COMT gene. Together, they determine whether you're an under or an over methylator. And this also greatly influences whether you thrive or crash on a vegan diet. Under methylators, especially those with low serotonin, often don't tolerate a lot of leafy greens. The reason being their high folate content. They usually feel better on a high protein diet and more methionine, which is the primary methyl donor in our diet. This, of course, is easier to implement with animal products than with a vegan diet. Overmethylators, on the other hand, thrive on leafy greens because they need more folates. They tend to do better on plant-based diets, especially if they aren't too high in grains, because the copper in grains adds to their overstimulated nervous system. This brings me to the last thing I want to talk about, and it's not a gene, but rather a nutrient ratio. I already mentioned it before, the zinc-copper ratio. It's extremely important for your health, and many people have an unbalanced zinc-copper ratio. What you need to know is that copper tends to be stimulating, whereas zinc is calming. Zinc favors GABA, which is a calming neurotransmitter, while copper favors noradrenaline and adrenaline, both stimulating neurotransmitters. The ratio also affects your hormones. Copper favors estrogen, while zinc favors progesterone and testosterone. Knowing your zinc-copper ratio is crucial before setting up a new diet. If you are already copper dominant, then a vegan diet will make this worse. Especially if your body cannot get rid of excess copper, which is mostly dependent on your liver function. I talk about this in more detail in a different video, where I explain why the common trend of ex-vegans going carnivore is mostly based on people unknowingly fixing their zinc-copper ratio. Great, with all of this in mind, can we now summarize who will thrive on a vegan diet and who will most likely crash? I believe we can. Someone who will most likely do fine should have no BCMO1 polymorphism, be a normal or overmethylator, and if they're an overmethylator, they shouldn't overdo on grains. They should also have strong adrenal glands for energy production, strong thyroid function for the expression of BCMO1, and strong liver function for bioproduction and copper removal. On top of that, they should have good zinc, magnesium, and calcium reserves because these are all calming nutrients that balance the stimulating effect of a vegan grain-heavy diet. Those most likely to crash would be the reverse, so someone with a BCMO1 polymorphism, an undermethylator, especially the low serotonin type that doesn't tolerate a lot of leafy greens, and someone with weak adrenals, weak thyroid, and weak liver function, especially if they already have low zinc, magnesium, and calcium reserves to buffer the stimulating effect of the copper in the grains. Now, of course, all of this assumes a healthy vegan diet on the one hand and a healthy mixed diet on the other. If you go from an unhealthy mixed diet full of junk foods to a healthy vegan diet full of quality vegetables, then you will likely still see health benefits. But that's just because you're eliminating all the junk from your meal plan. With that, let me wrap up this video. I hope it gave you a good overview of the pros and cons of plant-based diets and who will thrive or crash on them. Of course, these are just general tendencies and your individual outcomes will depend on your circumstances and preferences. As you know, no diet is perfect for everyone. I hope you like this video and I see you in the next one.